This is interesting. The EPA figures that light duty trucks should reach 225,865 miles on average. It works out to be about 16 years if you drive about 14,000 miles a year. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Hey, it's Tim, pickup truck plus SUV talk. Yesterday, I had a chance to interview a gentleman who works for a major automaker, and we we're discussing the EPA rules and the new gasoline particulate filters, what's happening, the level four rules coming out. And I just wanted to get all this information out to you guys. And so you guys are informed consumers. You guys must know what's going on too, because I learned a lot yesterday. Unfortunately, I did the interview on background, which means I didn't, I can't quote him. I can't say his name. He just gave me some details. And so I went and took my notes, all my notes, and I got some information for you guys in this video. So trust me, I talked to him. It's just, that's how the business works. So I want to go back to this and I want to discuss several things going on and things that uh, I think are really interesting for you guys out there shopping and going, why are we using turbo? Charge engines. Why do we have multi, more multi-speed transmissions? Hey, CO2 is what comes out of plants. Why? Who cares about that? Well, there's some more information going on with this. So what first thing I want to do is vehicle lifetime miles. So they use 195,264 passenger vehicles and 225,865 miles for light duty trucks. And so that works out to be about 14 years or 16 years. They get this information from automakers, from uh, reliability sources online. There's different databases they can use. And that's how they figure out how long vehicles last, and they use that information in calculating their final rules for CAFE guidance and for final rules for, you know, overall, what's the top page? The Federal Register of Rules and Regulations. So they use this information to calculate because here's the interesting part with the EPA and all these emissions rules you guys love to lament about in the comments is they actually have to show a benefit to the consumer. They can't just say, hey, we're going to make uh, less pollutants in the air. They have to say, okay, if we do less pollutants in the air, what happens with overall cost of vehicles? How much are consumers going to pay for this cost of clean air? How big are the vehicles going to be reliable? That's a really interesting one to me. Um, what's going to happen with long-term technologies? How they see the marketplace ch changing? So there's lots of really interesting pieces to that. So looking at my notes, so before we dive in, let's clear the air or well, let's get our terminology correct. So what's going on with the EPA rules? Actually, what's more important is also what's going on in the Euro 6 rules that's impacting China, Europe, and the United States. So it's not just the EPA putting these rules out. And actually, it was interesting yesterday, as I learned, EPA is actually behind the eight ball. Whoa, right, wow. People are thinking EPA is overly aggressive and doing a lot of things. We're actually a little bit slower adopting some things. And this is really interesting stuff. Trust me, details in this video. You may want to pop a top, pour another cup of coffee. And figure this out. So let's start with this because I was curious about what is the EPA and what is Euro 6? What's China? What's Europe really focusing on? Well, they're focusing on carbon dioxide emissions. So there's carbon monoxide, the silent killer to kill you, and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is CO2, which is happens naturally occurring in the, in the present atmosphere, right? It's part of the Earth's carbon cycle. It comes out of plants. We breathe it. It's not a big deal. It's, 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 it's not anything that is going to kill us, like carbon monoxide. However, if we have too much carbon in dioxide in the atmosphere, that's the focus of most of these regulations. That's creating more greenhouse gases, which is more linked to climate change, which is more linked to raising uh, temperatures and water levels and all this kind of stuff that people get really frustrated about because uh, a lot of people think still think climate change is a hoax. People still think that this is all garbage, but this is what's been, this is the focus. So you can agree or disagree politically with me. I don't, I don't care. I don't think, <laughs> I don't want to get in politics, but this is the focus. This is the key metric, carbon dioxide. So if you look at carbon dioxide emissions by economic sector, which I think is really interesting too, this is where it really focuses on your truck and your diesel truck. Transportation, it, it accounts for 35% of total U.S. CO2 emissions and 28% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. So we have CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. A little different things, we'll talk more about this. This is includes domestic transportation such as highway, passenger vehicles, air travel, marine transportation, and rail. So we have planes, trains, automobiles. Okay, we got it all there in the carbon dioxide sector. So that's why the EPA's rules have been impacting trucks for a while now. We've seen a lot of massive changes in the past couple of years. We've seen, and I'll show you some trending charts here in a minute, but if you've been following the truck market like I have, maybe not as close as I have, you're gonna see like, my gosh, the trucks in 10 years, we've added turbocharged engines, we've dropped V8 engines, we've added cylinder deactivation, 
We have added more uh, multi-speed transmissions. We have a greater growth of gasoline direct injection. We're also seeing direct injection and port injection. We're seeing hybrids. We're seeing plug-in hybrid. We're seeing a lot of stuff going on. And this was the level three phase in of the rules. We'll get to level four phase in a little bit. And a lot of people will say the easier way to say these phases and these rules is to link them to presidents. So, right. So we had the Obama change. We had the Trump change and we had the Biden change and then we keep ramping up. So we're going to see level four. It's going to be next one coming out. It'll be 2027 model year, 28 or 2030, depending on what the automaker is looking at as far as what their internal guidelines tell them to do for new vehicles. So we're, so we're talking about this. So we said carbon dioxide is not a problem, except when you have too much. The abundance of carbon dioxide is what the EPA is focusing on. Now, they're also focusing on critical or criteria pollutants. Now, this is a key thing because this created the catalytic converter. So these six pollutants are carbon monoxide, the slant killer to kill you, ground level ozone, nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, and sulfur dioxide. Particulate matter, we're going to get to a little more details of that. That's really, that's going to be one of the big changes happening level four. Those components are basically known as smog components. They're what, it's what creates smog. And so when stuff started happening in the 70s and 80s, started a lot of smog. Like, in, I remember watching uh, football games, Three River Stadium. I, I bring this all the time because now they can fly a drone over that stadium and you can see the field of play really nice. You can see uh, the city's all like cleaned up and they show back and they, they always. Not always, but every once in a while on Monday Night Football, whatever, they'll show the before and after of Pittsburgh. And it's pretty, it's pretty crazy to see that difference. So what what do we do? We did carbon dioxide, we got rid of carbon monoxide through catalytic converters. And this catalytic converter, I'm gonna get to a little more details in a little bit. I'm sorry to give you some teasers here, but I just want to lay the groundwork in this video. So we have harmful emissions, we have hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen. So these are unbent, unburnt fuel, they're the incomplete combustion. They go into the catalytic converter and they come out as water, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. All less harmful emissions, those things are not a big deal. Again, it's the quantity of these emissions that is creating the issue. Okay, that's how catalytic converters work. Okay, so they, they take away that bad carbon monoxide. It actually will kill you in the house too. That's why I have carbon monoxide detectors. And translates that into carbon dioxide, which is what comes from plants. And as I just said, abundance of CO2 is what the focus is on. And that's Europe, China, United States are all focusing on the abundance of CO2 emissions. And so what's interesting here is if you look at a sticker on a vehicle, which I'll put on the screen, it's called the Monroney label. You'll see two numbers on here, which are important. You'll see greenhouse gas emissions, which is CO2 per mile. That's what they're targeting. How many CO2 carbon dioxide per mile you're putting out and also Fuel economy. So fuel economy is based on corporate average fuel economy. And that fuel economy's number is based on different EPA testing, which also includes real world fuel economy. They actually have that charts in here as well. And they're looking at that number is going to be really equal to greenhouse gas emissions, right? So if you have more efficient vehicle, you burn less fuel, which means you create less carbon in the combustion cycle, which means you have less carbon going out the tailpipe. And so that's why those two things are, are combined. That's why you'll hear automakers and you'll hear politicians talk about increase in the fuel economy across the average fleet. And that reduces emissions because we have less combustion and less carbon dioxide going out through the tailpipe. And you can see this in this chart here on the screen. You'll see this. This is, again, that long 374 page government speak document. But they have these really interesting charts I found this morning and they have different tables and they talk about projected targets for the final light duty vehicle standards. And they're looking at this by regulatory class, CO2 grams per mile, okay? So you have cars and trucks and you have CO2 grams per mile. And looking at, if you look at through the, I told you level four standards are gonna come out in 2031, 32, depending on the automaker, you can see the CO2 grams per mile right now for 2027 model year is 184 grams per mile. By 2032, they anticipate that being gone, dropped in half. And it's interesting, there's a lot of reasons why, and I'll get to those reasons why. Now, if we don't do anything, if we don't do any change, the EPA doesn't do anything, no adopted, no standards are adopted, we'll stay with 185 or 184. I'm not sure why those are different. It's kind of weird. Um, but by 2032, we'll see CO2 grams per mile go to 185. So we actually see number of grams per mile go up over that time period. And why is that? Well, we're looking at now the changing marketplace between the car and truck mix. 
Right now, we're seeing more trucks being sold. And what the EPA is estimating through different reports they get from different uh, parts of the government is that the trucks will still be the lion's share in the marketplace moving forward. So they're looking at the trucks, amount of trucks being sold in the marketplace growing. So right now, it's going to get to the point where they're talking about it's going to be 70 30. So by 2032, they anticipate out of the, the no, total number of vehicles sold in the new model year, 70% will be trucks and 30% will be cars. That's why trucks have been taking lion's share of changes lately, where we've seen new turbocharged engines, new uh, uh, cylinder deactivation, multi speed transmissions happening in trucks and make a big impact the last couple of years because EPA is targeting that because of the customer swing in the marketplace. So you guys are buying more trucks and they're like, oh, well, that, we didn't calculate that when the Obama rule went through. Now the Trump rule, a little bit changed that, and then Biden's rule, a little bit changed even more. So we're seeing this change in the marketplace. And so really consumers are driving the change by what you're buying, which is driving the change in the regulatory emission standards. Okay, let's talk about one more thing in this document before I transition to something else, and that's maintenance costs. I found this fascinating. I'd asked my source, does the EPA ever calculate reliability in this stuff? You're making these truck engines more complex, more stuff to break, and aren't we going to see more reliability issues? And they actually do, and they do this in maintenance costs. So this is interesting. They're looking at overall maintenance costs of the vehicles from the thousands of miles. They figure out how much maintenance costs are annually, and they put this into their final rulemaking. So they've decided that if they make vehicles more efficient and they make vehicles emit less, we'll actually see a reduction in health claim costs. And so all of us will breathe cleaner air and have less lung issues and less cancer issues. They also figure that, that the maintenance costs are going to be less for some vehicles versus others. So like a straight ICE vehicle will have a higher co maintenance cost per mile versus a plug-in hybrid versus a hybrid versus a battery electric vehicle. Even though some critics have said, well, battery electric vehicles here replace the battery, we haven't seen that. The EPA disagrees that high voltage batteries will routinely need to be replaced in this way during the useful life of vehicle. And this makes sense. We haven't seen it very often in the last 10 years, even more that with, you know, with Tesla's and Nissan Leafs, stuff like that. We haven't seen full battery replacements on BEV vehicles, which are fully electric vehicles. So that's interesting about battery electric vehicles, that they don't anticipate those batteries being changed very often. Now, what's also interesting is the maintenance costs for the gas vehicles. What EPA is saying here and what their analysis is saying from different government agencies is saying, look, on most vehicles and most trucks and things these days, we're going to save the consumer money, even though they're becoming more complex, which that's a really interesting viewpoint. Um, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, but what they're saying is we're going to see consumers will spend less on fuel, less on maintenance, and that'll increase their total savings. I'm buying a new vehicle. The EPA estimates $6,000 in fuel savings, less maintenance for the consumer by adopting this rule. They also anticipate, anticipate automakers will spend about $1,400 more to make these compliance things happen for vehicles for the next, these rules and moving forward level four rules, which we'll get to in a little bit. So this is, this is the interesting part. So ICE vehicles, plug-in hybrid, hybrid vehicles, and full battery electric, looking at dollars per mile of maintenance costs. And you can see BEV vehicles have less, right? No oil changes, no, um, the battery, as I just said, won't need to be replaced. And the pe the PEV, the plug-in hybrid and the hybrid vehicles, similar idea, right? Less fuel being spent because you're running electric mode only. And you're saying that the highest number will be ICE. So if they adopt these rules, they anticipate those changes will happen for customers as far as price. Okay, now let's go to this report. This is the EPA Automotive Trends Report. Now, this is going to look back all the way to 1975 model year. Why does that matter, 1975? That's when they started actually tracking the trends in the industry, collecting data since that model year. So looking at the information, we can see since 1975, our fuel economy has gone up and our overall emissions have gone down. We just set a record on both last year or for model year 2022 in that our fuel economy is at 26% or 26 uh, mile per gallon. Now that is a real world fuel economy increased by 0.6 mile per gallon, not EPA testing. Real world fuel economy increased to a record of 26, per, 26 miles per gallon. How they know that? Well, they have the fuelie.org, which is the government website that tracks fuel economy from consumers. So we're not talking about that on a sticker, we're talking about real consumers. 
Now, we also saw the grams per mile on the overall fleet of real world emissions fell by 10 grams per mile, the 33, 337 grams per mile. That's the lowest they've ever measured. And so we're seeing some big impacts. You can see the big impacts from like 05 to 15 to 2025. So the reasons why trucks are getting more complex, the engines are getting more complex, is right here. We're seeing fuel economy go up. We're seeing CO2 emissions go down. That's a big deal. Now, how do we get there? Let's let's talk about how, how we're getting there. So looking at this page, this chart, we're seeing a relative change in fuel economy, weight, horsepower, and footprint. Uh, this is really interesting because we're comparing a lot of things here. So we're all we're seeing, first of all, real world fuel economy has gone up to a record levels. We're seeing horsepower has gone up. So the EPA is looking at not just fuel economy, look at look at the improvements in horsepower. And yeah, if you've ever driven like a, a, a 2002 truck to a new truck, I mean, you're going to see a lot of difference in horsepower and torque. They really pull a lot better. They really have better fuel economy and you're seeing this happen. And that's even with the overall weight of the vehicles going higher and the overall footprint, which is the bottom chart down there, going bigger. So in the Obama rule, they made a change, which I'll go by by presidents, like I said, because most people view these rules by presidents, Obama, Carter, Trump, Biden, uh, even though the footprint's gone bigger because the way the, the EPA has changed how they measure the overall vehicle, the horsepower and fuel economy have gone up. So yes, trucks have gotten bigger. And yes, we have these big, massive trucks running around, but they've also gotten more fuel efficient too. And they pollute less as well. So this idea that these big, bad trucks are polluting all the stuff and that really terrible fuel economy has to go smaller doesn't always factor in to reality. Yes, even though trucks have gotten bigger, we are having less pollutants going out there and they're getting more fuel efficient. Now, how are we getting there? Let's look at this. This is the big change you guys have been noticing as consumers. So gasoline engine production share by number of cylinders. We saw a spike in V8s when it first started off in 1975. Over 50% of the engines out there were V8 engines. We have seen that go down dramatically in the 80s when they started doing some turbocharged stuff for a variety of reasons that, well, they weren't as reliable, but we've seen some changes. And now we're seeing turbos be more reliable. We're seeing things happening even more. So we're seeing number of shares of cylinders, production share of cylinders from manufacturers has changed dramatically. We're now seeing a lot of vehicles with four cylinder engines. And we're seeing a lot of vehicles that had less than eight cylinders. We're seeing this line kind of go down. And why do we have that happening? Well, there's two ways to really to get CO2 grams per mile be lower. And automakers are taking two different paths. So you can say, you can take your V8 and you can say, I'm going to make a V8 with cylinder deactivation like GM and RAM does and make the V8 into the four cylinder. And I'll get to my CO2 grams per mile targets. Or you can do more like what Ford has done. And you can say, all right, well, we're going to not only hybrid these trucks, we'll do a hybrid version. Well, we're going to take the V8, turn it into a V6, and then we're going to put a turbo on the V6 to make it act like a V8 when we need to have the V8. So we have these two different approaches to getting that done. And that's why we're seeing these changes in cylinders. We're seeing automakers say, hey, look, the V8, we get it. Uh, it's it's always been a, it's been a stalwart for a while. Uh, people love the reliability of it. But we're seeing these V6s get more be more reliable. We're seeing turbos get more reliable. And customers are starting to build, buy more of these vehicles because now we're seeing production share change. And we're seeing that change the marketplace. And so this is that's why that's happening. We're seeing more turbos or some deactivation to get to this level. Now, another thing we're seeing happen, like I said, with, with different engine technologies, we're seeing the production share of turbocharged engines change dramatically. And this is share by vehicle type. So we're seeing trucks. We're seeing uh, uh, SUVs. We're seeing minivans. Uh, we're seeing cars, we're seeing sedans and wagons all increase the number of the truck SUV, by the way, is a body on frame. We're seeing all these numbers change to increase the number of turbos out there. So production share is going up of turbocharged engines and it's going up in smaller displacement engines. And we're seeing that the production share by number of cylinders. So as we're seeing four cylinders become more dominant, we're seeing this happen. What Chevy Colorado is Four cylinders, we're seeing they offer a 2.7 liter four cylinder for the uh, Silverado. We're seeing the same thing happen in other vehicles. Uh, Ford in the Ranger has a four cylinder as well as a V6. And we're seeing the production share of those things changing because, again, better emissions. You get better horsepower, better torque, as we saw that last slide. Horsepower and torque have gone up. 
weight has gone has stayed the same or gone up a little bit. We're seeing more efficient engines. Okay, the final change we're seeing is with transmission gearing. So you've seen this happen in the last couple of years. We've gone from uh, four speeds to six speeds to eight speeds, to 10 speeds, and we're seeing this change happen and you're seeing it in this chart. And the reason why we're seeing this happen is because those transmissions at different speeds can get the engine to, to produce its optimal horsepower and torque and have a better peak efficiency and which uses less fuel, which creates less greenhouse gas emissions, right? So, okay, let's talk about what's coming. What's gonna come in level four emissions? And this is getting the rules being in place right now. This is Europe doing them, China doing, the United States doing them. What's gonna impact the consumer happening in that model years, right, coming forward? And it's gonna vary by automakers because automakers of all have pledges now to be environmentally more friendly. And they're doing this stuff regardless of what the governments are doing in some areas, they're moving forward with their own plans. So what are you gonna have happening in the marketplace. We're going to see three key things, according to my source. There's three key ways to reduce the particulate matter, which is the goal, which was the uh, criteria pollutants. That's going to be one of the focuses. How do we get less of those criteria pollutants in the atmosphere and particulate matter especially? Well, I talked about this last week in a video. We're going to see gasoline particulate filters be added to vehicles in the United States. This particulate filter is in use in Europe right now. And that's one of the things the EPA is a little behind on. They've kind of waiting to say, you know what? We're not going to ask automakers to do that in the United States yet. We want to see how it works in Europe and China. What are consumers saying? What's consumer reports saying over there? What's the impact back from the uh, different automotive industry? What's what's the executive saying? What data do we have that shows that gasoline ticket filters will be reliable? Which I just blew my mind on that one. So gasoline particulate filters will be added to these engines and it's so in the case like the toyota tundra that engine sold globally it already has gasoline particulate filters in a global marketplace but not in the united states yet so we're going to see that adding second thing we're going to add we're going to see some changes to the catalytic converter we're either going to see the catalytic converter getting bigger or we're going to see the use of the rare metals change up a little bit whatever the composition is of the catalytic converter we're going to see the catalytic converter is going to change to knock down some of these these uh, criteria pollutants, which I showed in that chart, how the, how the catalytic converter works, and we'll have less carbon uh, monoxide and pollutants going through catalytic converter coming out the exhaust pipe. We're going to see that change. The third thing we're going to see change is we're going to see more sophisticated systems inside vehicles to use fuel more efficiently and to pollute less. So we're going to talk about like drive modes and things, which is something interesting the EPA is starting to do is they're starting to do more testing on different cycles in that we're seeing they're gonna, they are gonna they started testing more for a cold start, started testing more for a warm start, started testing at highway speeds. And they've also done a change as well. They're starting to look at more real world fuel economy as far as how consumers are driving them. Currently, they look at about 45% highway, 55% uh, city. What they're finding is most consumers are driving about 55% highway and 45% city. So kind of a, a reverse there. So that's why some of the level four changes are happening just based on marketplace, and based on how consumers are using the vehicles, we're going to see those three changes coming. And I think you'll find that in the case of catalytic converters, it's probably not that big of a deal. I'm, I'm assuming in the comments, I'm not going to hear too much about that because, again, catalytic converters have been out for decades now, and they've been pretty reliable systems. But I think we're going to hear some pushback from, from consumers about these gasoline ticket filters. Gasoline engines don't really pollute that much as, as you would a, a diesel does because a diesel the fuel emits more carbons in the combustion cycle than you have a gasoline vehicle do. But we're going to see that happening to meet these level four requirements for less particulate matter that I showed you in the chart, less greenhouse gas emissions, because we want to get even tighter on that kind of stuff. And the third thing, computerized systems, I think we're going to see more and more, and we're already seeing this, uh, more sophisticated some of the activation systems, more changes to gasoline and direct injection and even port injection to get those systems to shoot less fuel in to still create the same horsepower and torque you need. We're going to see that happening. I don't think we're going to see the same big changes, though, that we saw for the last couple of years. We're not going to see this death of the V8. We're not going to see a death of, of fully electric. We're going to see more and more electrification in engines. This is what gets people kind of fired up, and, and it, it gets me fired up when I hear it, too, is people keep talking about we're all going to go electric. No, we're not. Because the term electric means we're going to drive electric cars only. No, no, no. We're going to have electrification in the engines throughout global markets through a hybrid, a plug-in hybrid, or some sort of electrification on the vehicle. 
yes, naturally aspirated V8 engine is going to go away based on global emission standards in Europe, China, and the United States. But we're going to see more sophisticated systems, more turbos, more cylinder activation, more transmissions. And we're also going to see more hybrids, more mild hybrids, and more different systems using electrification in the engine. So don't get all fired up when it says, oh, the world's going to be electric at some point. No, the world's going to be a, the automotive market's going to have a version electric in it. It's going to have a hybrid system. We're going to see this also, and we're going to see it in planes. We're going to see it in trains. We're going to see it in uh, transportation sectors. We can see it a lot, I said, in the global marketplace. So I think those are the big changes. So from my takeaway, when I got done talking to them, I was a little bit more relaxed. <laughs> I was a little more like, okay, so we've seen all these massive changes happening and all these all these concerns, reliability, and now they're going to slowly phase in the next realm of tier four. But tier four doesn't sound nearly as scary to me when we made all these changes happen back in a couple of years ago, where we started just killing V8s and doing transmissions that changes happening. So I think I could handle the small little changes now, as long as we're phasing them in. And we've already seen how some of those systems have worked in Europe before we come over here. So we have an idea what the reliability is going to be on those videos, on the videos, vehicles. Okay. Holy cow. My brain is fried. Carbon dioxide is concern, not monoxide but it's only concerned if you have too much of it. Ooh. Yeah, the lot of stuff going on in my head. So I'm curious what you guys think. Uh, I just, I want to shoot this video because I have a really interesting stuff I got yesterday and it really helps me um, be more of an informed consumer, which helps you to be more of a warm consumer. And I hope you watched the video. I hope you enjoyed it. So make sure to check out other videos on the channel over here. Ah, it's outside. Website down below as well, pickuptrucktalk.com. As always, thanks for watching. I will see you down the road.